All right. Thank you all for being here. Welcome. And uh, I hope you've got, got something to drink and uh, eat. My name is Jeff Kossif. I'm one of the two directors of the, the Woods Institute. Uh, so we're uh, the host of this event, along with, uh, with others. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker this evening. And he told me to make it short. <laughs> so I could just turn it over to him right now, but I don't think that would be nice. So I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Um, I've known him for a long, long time. We actually, this is the part that you don't know by going on, online and, and reading about it. We actually played on the same tennis team together. <laughs> at SCRA, Stanford Community Recreation Association. 4.0 USTA, which is 4.0, you're not too bad, right? And, uh, and Steve and Mark Feldman were a doubles team, and uh, we actually did very well. We went to the playoffs <laughs> in Alameda, but we lost in 115 degree heat. And so, uh, so anyway, that's a, that's one story that you will not find anywhere. Else. <laughs> and I don't know if Steve still plays tennis, but he's a great player. Anyway, currently he's the William Kennan Professor of Physics and a professor of molecular and cellular physiology, which is an interesting. Uh, progression in his career. It's in the medical school. Yeah, so he's, he's, uh, he's doing interesting things. Interesting enough, Steve was one of the three or four people that did one of the most important things in the last uh, 10 or 20 years at Stanford is he came together with some people in biology and, and, and others and essentially laid out the blueprint for BioX, which essentially you can think of as being Stanford's first serious foray into interdisciplinary scholarship and research and laid the foundation for the Precord Institute, for the Woods Institute, and for many other uh, interdisciplinary uh, initiatives at Stanford. Really important activity. As you all know, for four and a half years, he was the Secretary of Energy. He started a number of innovative programs as the Secretary. Uh, before that, he was uh, the head of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs uh, and a professor at, at Berkeley. <laughs> Where he got his graduate degree after getting his undergraduate at the University of Rochester. And then, of course, before that, he was professor of physics uh, at Stanford for many years uh, and a Nobel laureate uh, in 1997, I believe, in, in, in physics as well. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have Steve back at, at Stanford, uh, where he belongs. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to, to hearing these remarks this evening. So please join me in welcoming Steve Chu. Thank you. Um, is, this, is this on? I don't know. It is? Oh, it's re for this. Oh, great. Great. Okay, so um, um, in terms of my Berkeley connection, yes, I was a graduate student there and I was a postdoc. And then they made me an assistant professor. But it was a big debate because I spent eight years. So they said, well, you know, you can start your group now or you can take a leave of absence immediately and go learn about something, but the job is yours, so what do you want to do? So I said, oh, that sounds cool, I'll take the job. It was then the, the number one department in the world. So, and then I went to Bell Laboratories and sadly after a year and a half, I found it very difficult to go back, uh, but things were working very well and and so, uh, so I, but I finally said, I have to go back because I made a commitment. So I said, okay, to Bell Labs, I'm going back. And then I didn't sleep for three days. And, and so I said, mm, my body's telling me something. And so uh, I hope s some of the faculty members at Berkeley said, you shouldn't come back. You're doing it wonderfully. Others say, well, you know, you've held a faculty slot now for a year and a half. Come on back. Um, they for did forgive me, <laughs> uh, but it was something where I did go back. It was 26 years later. <laughs> uh, uh, then I spent nine years at Bell Laboratories. Uh, then I decided when I was going to come out, uh, I decided to come to Stanford rather than go back to Berkeley for other reasons. Uh, uh, actually, I'll tell you what the reason was. It was very simple. At the time, Stanford had a teeny tiny physics department, 22 people. My thesis advisor at Berkeley said, what do you want to go and be a big fish at Stanford where you can come to Berkeley? 
and and where you know it's a big pond and everything. And I said, well, you know, it was in the top three or four. Stanford was, but it's. I said in the next ten years, forty percent of the faculty will retire, and either you build back up the department, or it just goes into second tier. And I thought that was much more exciting to take a gamble and come to Stanford than it was to go to Berkeley, which still was in the top three. And it had very powerful, you know, influential professors. So, so I took the gamble and came and tried because the, the thought of, you know, helping rebuild was actually strangely more exciting. I should say I went to the lowest bidder. Uh, <laughs> Then Berkeley said, are you really serious? I come back, we want to bid. And I said, okay, fine. And I asked for a certain, it was large, in those days, a large amount of money. It was a half a million dollars of startup money in 87. And Stanford said, okay. You know, what, they said, what would it take you to get you here? I said, that, okay. So at Berkeley said, said, well, I'm going to probably inherit some of Art Shallow, who's an co-inventor co -inventor of the laser, so maybe 600,000. You know, but that's, you know, and this is what I told Stanford. It was very up and up about that. So they offered me 900000 And then Harvard put in a bid, and I told them the same thing, 600000 and they just doubled it, which is a very strange negotiating position. <laughs> I said, this is what I'm asking, you know, that's it. And, and, uh, and so Stanford was absolutely the lowest bidder. <laughs> Uh, by 2x, <laughs> two and, you know, uh, but I was very happy I did come here. I did help rebuild and, you know, and, and for those of you who don't know, in, in a period of about eight years, Stanford Physics and Slack got six Nobel Prizes. So it became a big pond <laughs> in physics. <laughs> we got four in a row. <laughs> uh, and so that was good. Um, you know, it was it was a, a, a very thing I'm very proud of. Four four of us got together and started this BioX thing, and we sold it to the president provost within a few weeks. And they, you know, and then so that was nice. Uh, uh, it's something I feel very strongly about. That if you have some, a lot of some of the most exciting things happen at the interface of areas. Some of the worst things can happen in an interface, uh, but some of the, the most exciting things happen, and, and that vision was, it, it's like all the energy institutes, it's like, you know, can you combine engineering and physical sciences, biological science and medicine to do things with teams of people you just couldn't simply do before. So that, that I'm very happy with. Now when I came back, uh, I was going to leave the government, I didn't want to be an administrator, I didn't want to the university president or anything like that. Uh, I didn't want to head an institute. I said, no, I don't want any of that stuff. Uh, I just want to be a faculty member. And I did the usual sort of hard sell. I told the president, the provost, you're the, I'm only asking you if you're interested to make a bid, but I'm asking no other school. You should understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Should they give you a good bid? It was the only bid. It was the best bid, <laughs> and I wasn't really asking, but you know, but the, 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 the president said, "Well, we think this," and I said, "That's good." You know, and everything, that's good. And the provost said, and then I talked to the provost next couple, you know, a month later, and he upped the bid. I, I already told the president, "No, that's good." So, so it, <laughs> and and, um, but it's, and it was an informal agreement. I'm not going to ask for the moon. I'm not going to ask for this. Thing. Look. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to start, I'm going to do some teaching, I'm going to do research, I'm going to do all that. Um, um, I don't know how much I need, and so John Edgerman, he said, we'll take care of you, don't worry. So I said, fine. <laughs> so it wasn't, a, you know, and so, which is what I love about this school, by the way, uh, is that, um, what I liked about it is when we try to hire people, we try to recognize value, we try to do these things, and, and it's not bargaining business all the time, you know, and so, so you're all very lucky to be here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm very fond of Berkeley. 
I have lots of friends at Berkeley. As they said, I spent eight years there. I was on the faculty there twice. Um, um, but I liked here better. For <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I can talk about a lot of things, but I'd rather just interact with you and answer your questions. Um, uh, I just a few observations. I think someone asked me, you know, what's it like to be working in the government as a scientist, things of that nature. Um, it was different. Um, I was the first scientists to ever hold a cabinet position in the United States if you don't count Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and that's up for debate because he was officially counted as the first Secretary of State, but he spent all his time in Paris. <laughs> but Benjamin Franklin was definitely a very serious scientist. <laughs> so I'm in good company. Uh, when I told the President in the third week in November after the election, after uh, and he lined up all his time, and he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I happened to be first on line. I said, Mr. President, look, I really enjoy working for you, but m my wife wants to go back to California and with around me, so I think I'm going to follow. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, okay, I understand that. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, what one can do in the next four years given the growing dysfunctionality in Congress, things of that nature. But at the very end, I said, you know, Mr. President, um, you hired a scientist who was never politically connected. I never campaigned for anyone in my life, okay, including him. Um, I, and you hired me because I was a scientist and I understood about energy, I understood about nuclear security. I said, okay, do it again. Uh, there are a lot of people in the, his inner circle who didn't want a scientist because, you know, they could do something really strange like tell the truth about it. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to what a poll might say. And uh, I'm just being, that's somewhat facetious, but, but, but they, we, we do behave a little differently. And um, he did it again. You know, secretary number two is a, is a scientist. He's not quite a practicing scientist, but he's a very smart guy. And so my fingers are crossed. I hope the best for him. But I take my hat. I said, Mr. President, you get a lot of credit for that. Just do it again. And he did it again. And my his, his advisors said, no, don't do this. OK. So um, I did learn a few general rules in watching. You know, physicists do this. We, we don't want, we, we see these patterns. And you try to, it's like the laws of thermodynamics. Like heat does not flow from cold to hot. Okay, that's, that's a law of thermodynamics. <laughs> um, uh, energy is conserved. That's another law of thermodynamics. First law. Okay, things go to more disorder. Second law. Okay, so these things are probably in the end never going to be found to be untrue, but they're based on observations that seem just to be true. Okay, so, um, so here's a few laws I, I put together as a physicist. One is called the theory of mud. What's the theory of mud? Okay, if you want to smear somebody <laughs> and you throw mud and you know it's not going to stick because in the end it's not true. So, you know, it'll slide off. But if you throw mud fast enough, you <laughs> achieve your goal. You're still covered in mud. <laughs> and so that happens. There's a correlated theory of mud. If you say something loud enough, long enough, the public gets confused and they think maybe the truth might lie somewhere in the middle. Okay. Uh, and, and that is, and, and, and sometimes people say things they know are not true, but they just do it and, and it confuses the public. That's the correlated theory of mud. There are, you know, if you're in politics and running for elected office, in a certain sense I was in politics, but I never ran for office, but if you're running for office, there are three golden rules. Golden rule number two is get reelected. Okay, that's there's anyone can guess what the first rule is? Get elected. Get elected. <laughs> there's a third rule. Anyone can guess what the third rule is? Stay elected. No, get reelected is stay elected. So that's rule number two. When in doubt, consult rules number one and two. <laughs> <laughs> so that seems to be an important part that like a law of thermodynamics there. Now, having said all that, I think there are 
a number of very, very good people in DC who really care about the country and are trying to do this. Many of those people uh, were getting discouraged. I think Senator Bingaman, I became a big fan of his. He's now here. He stepped down from the Senate. He was uh, the chair of Energy and Water. Great guy. Really cared. Very smart. Had great staffers. Um, uh, the, on the other side of the aisle was Lisa Murkowski. Okay? They worked very well together. I thought she was great. You know, they maybe have different views and everything, but you know, intelligent, she really cared. Couldn't get the nomination of her own party. Okay, she, she had to run as a running candidate. And one by one, as I saw all the people in the first one or two years that I thought of, let's say, on the other side, of the aisle, I can work with this person. Oh, this is great. And they couldn't get the nomination of their party. Or they got so discouraged, I'm cashing, I'm, I'm tired of this. And it, so that was very sad to see people of that caliber not being able to, you know, you know, and they would tell me, you know, things have changed in the last 10 and 20 years, which is unfortunate. It, they're, you know, they no longer spend time in D.C. Uh, votes are only taken Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Many of them leave Thursday, a lot of, most of them leave Friday, and they don't come back until Monday. If you don't spend time in D.C. with your colleagues on one side of the aisle or with the other side of the aisle, you don't develop personal relationships, and you don't build up a trust. Let's see if we can work this out together. That plus, you know, the kind of gerrymandering that, that makes swing districts less likely is a systemic problem. I don't know how this country is going to solve that. It, it's, it's a, California's trying uh, by having a few uh, retired judges try to redistrict so you get some swing districts. And, you need swing districts to pull people in the middle. Say we've got to, you know, we've got to pass a budget. We've got to figure out what to do. And so I, I am concerned about that. But as I said there are so, there are an amazing number of good people in politics. There are an amazing number of good people in government service uh, that should not be discounted at all. And that that was also very refreshing to see. Um, but. Um, but you have to go walking in with your eyes open and say, you know, this is, you know, so I'm trying to give you an antidote for my cynical jokes, but, <laughs> but, but, but I really mean it. Uh, the country needs really smart people to help it and, and to lead it and, and even, you know, in the agencies. And most of what the Department of Energy does is not political at all. Zero politics. Sometimes you try to get it politicized for one reason or another, but it's not. It's, you just need competent, smart people. And that's very important. So if, if you're, okay, back there. Yeah, you brought up um, the staffers versus the actual congressmen. How much influence do the staffers have on the law? And did you ever find a place where you liked or didn't like a congressman but had the opposite feeling about their staffers? I think it both goes both ways. Sometimes I like the congressmen or, or, or the senators or, uh, and uh, it's, you know the really good ones had good staffers. Um, uh, but to answer your first question, uh, they could have incredible influence, really incredible influence, because it's in the fine print of the law that really matters. And what lobbyists try to do is influence the fine print of the law. Okay. And, you know, like the energy bill that went through the House, it got to be really complicated, like 800 pages. Every lobby group and every special interest started going in there to get a little bit of economic advantage. And, and it was crazy, okay? A lot of times, this, you know, some of these bills are four or five, six hundred pages long. You know, may, you know, not many of the people on the Hill will slog through and really understand the nuances. So it really is important. It's really good to have good staffers, but to, to work for a boss who really wants them to do this, rather than okay, you know, you know, these guys are contributing. You know, okay, <laughs> uh, since the Supreme Court, you didn't hear any of that, but <laughs> but it's it's it, it is very important. Uh, uh, some really good staffers, some less good ones. Um, it, I define really good as intelligent and but willing to have an open mind and listen that's all you can really ask right 
You can go in with preconceived notions, but you want to keep an open mind and listen. Okay. Um, and, uh, but it is surprisingly important how much of the details get written by the staff. Not only in Congress, but also in, in, um, on the executive branch side. Now I was, I don't, Jeff doesn't probably know this, but I kind of like to wade knee deep, ankle deep, neck deep in details. Um, because I love that. Uh, a lot of people don't, okay? And uh, uh, depending on the person's personality and what they want to do and, you know, all these other things. And so that support structure is also very important. Okay, um, uh, um, when we were rolling out a little mini website, I'm such a nerd, I said, okay, let me, you know, it had to be a little interactive. Let me sit down and try it out. That's not intuitive. So, and they get someone in the back and say, oh, you know, you know, how do I navigate this? Oh, this is way. No, this is not, no, try again because you can't put perch a person behind the head of the organization to tell them how to navigate a site. It has to be intuitive. And, and then you have to try out all sorts of different people to see if you can navigate this, right? And, and in writing interactive software, it takes a year or two to get it right. You know, Apple and Google, this is a subtle problem. And you can, you have to lock down the specifications at least a year, year and a half ahead, okay? And so, at, you know, probably know what I'm talking about, but it was very unfortunate because, <laughs> because um, it could have been avoided. And, and so, uh, but you know, you need people at least, you know, you know and states got it better. Uh, and they asked them how did they get it better, they started testing it with different audiences, different people, and beta testing and alpha testing, and, and early and often. And you have to lock down specs. Yeah. So anyway, yes? Yeah, so what's something you're really proud of during your time as Secretary of the uh, I'm very proud of starting RPE, which is a, for those of you who don't know, it's called Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency for Energy. Um, it's something that was recommended in a committee in 2005-2006 in a committee called Rising Above the Gathering Storm that Norm Augustine, former CEO and chair of Lockheed uh, Martin, chaired and I was on that committee. There were about 20 of us. You know, President Yale was on the committee. He was on the committee. Also, there were six presidents of universities, six CEOs or former CEOs of companies or, you know, if they're former, they were legendary CEOs like Norm Augustine or Roy Vagalos of Merck, and present CEOs of DuPont, ExxonMobil, okay? and there were six academics. I was one of the academics. And the charge was, how does the United States, you know, not only survive, but prosper in the 21st century of a flat world, you know, where business can go anywhere and everything else, and, and although we had points, the, the bottom line elevator 22nd elevator speech is very simple. Invest in the intellectual capital of the United States. K through 12, college, graduate school, create paths where that intellectual capital can be gainfully employed. And this in the end will be the basis of our prosperity. It's not gonna be minerals and oil. It's not gonna be, it's gonna be that. We did not isolate a particular field of engineering or science or this or that, except one, energy. And the committee said energy in the 21st century is gonna be so important for economic prosperity, for sustainability, for everything else, you gotta do something about energy. And what's gonna generate all the new ideas and that will lead to private sector investments that will lead to deployment. And so, why, so we recommended to create a DARPA-like organization, that was the defense, that would try to invest in things where the vast majority would fail, but we weren't looking for incremental change, we were looking for home runs. So as you know in baseball, 
when you swing for the fences, you strike out more. Most of the funding, federal funding, they want, oh, they want to say, you know, this is going to succeed. And, but if you ask the top researchers in this place, what fraction of the project you worked on worked, the very best ones, you will find, oh, a quarter, a fifth, something like that, okay? Because they're always trying to push the envelope and do something daring. Now, there's, so how can they be world-class researchers when 80% of them fail? You fail early, you get out, you move on. Okay, so the strategy of RPE was we would throw, if it's you know, a couple of million dollars at it, you had two and a half, three years, and that's it. The, how do you, if you're investing in daring things, how do you ever you know, separate the crockpot snake oil stuff from the good stuff? Because the newer it is, the less track record, and a new idea can be regarded as a brilliant new idea, or it can be regarded as, as snake oil, and some, a lot of them are. Or, and, and, uh, and so you needed people who were so good that they could actually decide, because they were themselves such competent people. And so we put together this team of very superb people that were, you know, um, the guy I brought in to head it was a friend of mine from Berkeley who got elected to the National Academy of Engineering when he was 44, but he was only 46. And we got people who were going to get elected to the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, other people who came in, who never would have come into government service. Believe me, if you're, if you're getting elected to the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering in your 40s, you know, do I want to serve in the government for three years? Mm, okay, so we got in these people. Generally not. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. If you're at Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard, or if you're a stellar person in, um, in a company, your career is going like that. So we got these people to come in. It was amazing. And, but, but it was a very flag organization. The director reported directly to me. We embedded the HR people, the human resource pe person. We embedded the lawyer in the organization. We insulated from the rest of the bureaucracy and said, go. And then I would, the director and I would sit down, and there were program managers, and you sit around. Let's say all you three or four people are program managers. You're in charge of this, you're in charge of that. No, it didn't work that way. You, we were brought in, your group interviewed by various individuals. They take a little vote as to who we want to bring in. It's almost like a faculty. Um, and, then, and then you say, well, you're not in charge of solar, you're not in charge of batteries, you're not in charge of electronics. You go find out something that we should be investing in. You organize a workshop, you do this, sell it to the rest of us. Okay, and we sit around a big table for hours and discuss this. Okay, and oh, and then it's impolite in the following sense. I don't agree with this. I don't think this is gonna work. They go to the board and they work it out right and there. Okay. Right? So, you know, it's not, oh, you know, you're not allowed to talk about someone else's program. You have to sit politely while they present. No, 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 no. So it was designed specifically on the experience I had at Bell Labs. Because that's what we did at Bell Labs. Okay. And it was really exciting. A lot of fun. The first generation, we, they, after three years, you had to move on. Uh, they're really stellar people. The next set are really stellar. Uh, the, you know, don't take it personally if I say I don't believe you. You know, just we're going to go board and we're going to figure it out. Uh, so, and then you would say, we don't give you money and come back in two or three years and tell us what you've done. Every quarter you work with them, the program managers. The, the board of directors and the CEOs of some of these companies said, this is amazing. These guys are so good. They are helping us solve our technical problems, and they're helping us write better business plans. <laughs> okay, repeatedly. You know, we meet with them every quarter, and you know, you give them freedom, but you say no. And that was, that was great, to get that class of people in there to do that. The second generation is in there. These guys are, you know, 
brilliant people. And they go back. Uh, um, Arun is actually coming here. Arun Majandar, uh, not completely by accident. You know, it's more, where are you going? No. <laughs> He's taking a year off. He's working for Google at an uh, incredible salary. <laughs> but he wants to be an, you know, come back and be an academic. Okay, and there's others like that. So there's just one person who is a stellar professor at MIT. I said, can you throw your hand ring to be the next director? He says, no. You know, I want to go back, and I haven't earned my stripes in terms of, you know, he's professionally ambitious, he, and I haven't, I'm not even, you know, he's in his late 30s. I'm not yet in the National Academy of Engineering. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you and Arun were different. You were both, you, know, you had a Nobel Prize, he had a National Academy. So we had half a dozen people already in the National Academy coming in the, the working department. And I said, well, you're going to get in the National Academy. He says, and, you know, if you, you can be, you know, you're so brilliant, you're going to be here. I says, yes, but I want to be elected for what I do as an engineer. <laughs> not because of public service, not because I've become a fancy bureaucrat. <laughs> so that's, again, part of the thing that I was very proud of, you know, the, that caliber of people. Um, and we were able to replicate it in other programs, not only RPE, but beginning to do it where, um, so I'm very, very proud of that, that, that there's that quality that you can bring in. And I would actually, you know, the guy who was head of the solar, new revamped solar program, Arun Majumdar and I, we both knew him, we'd call him on the phone. I would call up lots of people on the phone to bring in as program managers or sub-program managers. This is about eight levels down. But I will get on the phone and I will help identify these people, and I will then try to do the closing pitch. And it works. You know, it's like when the president-elect calls you and says, we want you to come to Chicago and talk about a job. And I say, I don't want to come, which is what I said. <laughs> Not to him, but if there's others, and, nah, I don't want to come. And then, no, no, it's a very important job. No, nah, I don't want to come. I'm, you know, you know, the first president asked me to throw my hand in ring. So I didn't want to do that. And no, this is very important. How important? Well, mm, Mm, okay, maybe I will at least show up. <laughs> and so uh, it does help if, if you have a well respected scientist or engineer who's going to call you up on the phone and say, come join me. Okay. Um, some of the things I'm less proud of, I could not stop some of the bureaucracy uh, that in the entrenched people do. And one of the people in a big gathering and assembly he raised his hand and said, it's the secretary. What are you going to do now? Um, this is not a PG statement. Says to stop the mind-numbing, soul-sucking bullshit. <laughs> 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 and I couldn't stop a lot of that. I tried in, <laughs> in various bits and pieces, but I couldn't stop some of that. Uh, I did try, uh, and maybe stop some, uh, some of it, not all of it. But um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of getting some of the employees who had been there for 10, 20 years to empower them to say, "You can do this. You don't have to hire consultants. You don't have to. You can do this yourself. You don't have to hire people to arrange a workshop. Do it yourself. Write the report yourself." You know, and why? Because you can become the subject matter expert and your market value in the outside world goes up. It's good for you, it's good for us. And with some people, they get frightened and other people rose to the occasion. And that was great, too. Maybe you want to see how you do for time. Uh, I can, you know, another 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, 30 minutes, okay. So uh, <clears throat> comparing when you walked into the cabinet in 2008 versus where we stand today, what do you think the most pressing energy issues the country were and how have they shifted over time or stayed the same? It's essentially the same. The most pressing issue is how do you transition to a sustainable energy future? It has remained the same. Um, you know, uh, yes, we have the whole landscape in oil and natural gas changed. Uh, North America could be largely energy independent. Okay, the the for those of you who don't know, the oil production in the United States has increased by 3 million barrels a day, uh, by 30%. Uh, we've passed Russia in terms of the largest producer of oil and natural gas. 
uh, Saudi Arabia still produces more oil, but we may overtake them in oil production. Okay, but that doesn't mean we don't have an energy problem. We have an energy problem. It's called climate change. <laughs> okay, and and so that's still very very important. The natural gas, and we, then we have to develop the natural gas in an environmentally responsible way. There have been mistakes in the past, and and that's something which uh, we need to do. Uh, uh, I believe it's possible. I know there are mistakes in the past, and then how do you develop the mechanisms, both incentives on the industry side, but also regulatory mechanisms to make sure major water tables aren't poisoned, you know, all this stuff. Um, there's also, I should say, a lot of FUD spreading. What's FUD? It's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's, think back, you, you guys are too young, but the older people here, in the 60s and 60s, where it was becoming noticed that cigarette smoking, the, as the population of the United States, starting with the males, started increasing cigarette smoking, went up more than 20-fold, from 1900 to 1950. Then